how people grow. You see, how they grow in spirit. Uh, it's parallel, if not the same thing as others, is parallel to uh, all your contemplative uh, and, med and meditative traditions. You have the dense dimension. The dense is body, mind, and uh, mind is brain waves and all of that. Body, bi biology, and all of that sort of stuff. And then uh, um, emotions. And you have your emotions, and they run the whole gamma of things like that. These things make up the dense dimension. And that dense, dense dimension is held by the frequency rate of your, uh, uh, of your uh, spirit's meditation or your con contemplative life moves. You know, once you move beyond the dense dimension, you move into what's called the uh, subtle dimension. The subtle dimension gets more subtle and more subtle and more subtle in its frequency that moves on. Uh, and, and it's that dimension that you, you gauge a person's spirit growth by. If you take the meditation steps, you, 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 you can move in that, stay in that third eye dimension uh, there uh, for years. And uh, it depends on how, uh, years and years and years. I was able to move, I think, in what's called the Sarvakapa dimension of uh, meditation, which is uh, you, you come absent to yourself with form. In other words, if you want to put brain waves, you have brain waves have moved down to into the, the, the uh, delta level, and you go out. In other words, you lose consciousness, deep sleep, if you want to put it that way, in the brain wave terminology. You're in deep sleep, but you're still awake. And so you're awake and you're meditating and you have, you go out, you notice that you go out, but the, you also notice you, you have uh, 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 meditation. I mean, things come in your life and in and out and everything. So you have that. Well, you keep on meditating, keep on meditating, and you hit nirvikapala. And nirvikapala is uh, absence without form. In other words, you have, uh, you go into absence and uh, you're out of it. And people talk, talk, everything else, you can be listening to lectures or whatever else, and you're gone. You have no way of knowing what's happening or where. And then suddenly you come out, and you know you've been gone, You had, and that's taken place. And that's what, your absence without form kind of thing. And that's what's called the Sahaja state. And that Sahaja state is a state in which you uh, live in uh, absence with, uh, without form. Let me catch my breath. I am not certain I am ready to take whatever journey Joe Slicker is beckoning me to practice. The deeper path is one we human beings generally approach with resistance. Perhaps Teresa of Avila can provide some guidance on this path and the practice of living from the center of one's being. Remember, the only reality we are dealing with is consciousness. Only consciousness? Yes, only consciousness. Therefore, no one else can do this for you. Only you can manage your own consciousness. Yikes! Teresa of Avila can lead us on a journey into the center of being, which is also the essential reality of each of us, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. The center of being is the center of being for all of us, but we must each solitarily make the journey. Is this Teresa of Avila currently on tour or doing concerts? Do I know her? In 1577, Teresa of Avila made the attempt to communicate the mysteries and paradoxes of the interior life to the other sisters in her convent. Things must have changed a lot since 1577. Actually, in the deep places, not at all. Oh, so how does this work? Imagine seven circles. Encompassed in one another, the outermost is the largest, and each circle leading into the center is smaller. The seventh or centermost circle is the center of being. The journey progresses from the outermost circle to the innermost. Each of the seven spheres represents a different state of consciousness and encompasses many states of being. Teresa used the metaphor of a castle carved from a great diamond with seven interior mansions. I began to think of the essential being as if it were a castle made of a single diamond or of a very clear crystal 
in which there are many rooms. The journey is one of transitioning from the outermost circle to the innermost and experiencing all of the interior adventures, struggles, ecstasies, aridities, and transformations along the way. Let us now imagine that this castle contains many mansions, some above, others below, others at each side, and in the center and midst of them all is the chiefest mansion, where the most secret things pass between God and the essential being. I get it. The goal is to get to the center. Well, sort of. You are already at the center. Your consciousness just may not have been trained to recognize it, or, more commonly, resists living a life from that deep center far beneath the surface. Let us imagine that God is like a very large and beautiful mansion or palace. For we ourselves are the castle, and it would be absurd to tell someone to enter a room when one is in it already. But you must understand that there are many ways of being in a place. It will be very helpful for us to think of this celestial building, which is within us and is so little understood by mortals. Now I am mostly confused. No problem. Remember, this is a metaphor. Let's start at a point you can easily grasp, the outermost circle. We can think about this as living on the surface of life. The outermost circle or wall of the castle can be understood roughly as your physical body or my physical body and life out and about in the world. We're all pretty good at identifying with our physical bodies, aren't we? In this surface state of consciousness, we're consumed attempting to satisfy our boundless drives, urges, cravings, lusts, hungers, compulsions, vanities, likes, dislikes, personal neurotic tendencies, personality disorders, propensities, and preoccupations. There isn't much energy or attention left over for anything other than this surface living with all of its compelling distractions and entertainments. Teresa compares this external edge of the castle to cavorting with the poisonous creatures and lizards, snakes and vipers, they prevent our essential being from seeing the light. So accustomed have they grown to living all the time with the reptiles and other creatures to be found in the outer court of the castle that they have almost become like them. Full of a thousand preoccupations as they are, they pray only a few times a month. And as a rule, they are thinking all the time of their preoccupations, for they are also very much attached to them, and where their treasure is, there is their heart also. Should I be taking this as some kind of personal assault on my character? I believe Teresa is simply attempting to communicate the mess that living on the surface of life always entails. Hmm... So how does one move beneath the surface? Eventually, they enter the first rooms on the lowest floor, but so many reptiles get in with them that they are unable to appreciate the beauty of the castle or to find any peace within it. Thought remains in the outskirts of the castle, suffering the assaults of a thousand wild and venomous creatures. Put a stop to all discursive reasoning. The very most we can know amounts to nothing at all. Okay, I get it. Now I am supposed to not know what I know. Actually, Teresa is encouraging us to know differently with our deepest center of being and not our head. Let's continue. The first rooms, the rooms of self-knowledge. I should like you never to relax your cultivation of it. So long as we are on this earth, nothing matters more to us than humility. That is the way to make progress. Surely, if you understand your own natures, it is impossible that you will not strive to remove the pitch which blackens the crystal. 
How distracted are the senses which inhabit them, and the faculties which are their governors and butlers and stewards, how blind they are and how ill-controlled. Can any evil be greater than the evil which we find in our own house? Let them place their trust not in themselves, but in the mercy of God. The essential being must not be compelled to remain for a long time in one single room, not at least unless it is the room of self-knowledge. However high a state the essential being may have attained, self-knowledge is incumbent upon it, and this it will never be able to neglect even should it so desire. Humility must always be doing its work like a bee making its honey in the hive. Without humility, all will be lost. Perhaps Teresa simply has a case of low self-esteem. You're not quite getting it. Humility as a posture is not very popular today. Yet, without authentic humility before a greater reality, all of our external relations, politics, economics, the shared environment, and our social interactions suffer through the blinding posture of self-service. This interior castle, you can enter it and walk about it at any time without asking leave from your superiors. The one who must admit you is a great lover of humility. Any good thing we do has its source not in ourselves, but rather in that spring where this tree, which is the essential being, is planted, and in that sun which sheds its radiance on our works. As a rule, when she did any good action, she never gave a thought to herself at all. Keep trying all the time to realize our poverty and wretchedness and to reflect that we possess nothing that we have not been given. So what else do I do to progress into these deeper realms beneath the surface of life? Just listen. There is an interior world close at hand. As far as I can understand, the door of entry into this castle is prayer and meditation. Essential beings without prayer are like people whose bodies or limbs are paralyzed. They possess feet and hands, but they cannot control them. The door by which we enter this castle is consciousness of our entanglement with ultimate reality. It is absurd to think that we can enter the center of being without first entering our own essential being without getting to know ourselves, and reflecting upon the estrangement of our nature and what we owe to God, and continually imploring God's mercy. The whole aim of meditation is to seek God. However sublime our prayer may be, we shall have to do this until we die. This practice sounds like breathing. It is unceasing. It is like breathing but this practice and posture are full of challenge, trial, and aridity. These periods of aridity may teach you to be humble and not make you restless. From these you will find out if you are really detached from the things you have abandoned, for trifling incidents arise which give you the opportunity to test yourself and discover if you have obtained the mastery over your passions. You must do violence to your own will. I have never read any such advice in the self-improvement or self-help section of the library. Teresa is interested in something deeper than human psychology. Keep listening. If we are truly humble, God, the physician, will come in due course to heal us. For there are all these obstacles for us to meet, and there is also the danger of serpents. When the one dwelling in the center begins to grant one's essential being greater favors, it also has to endure greater trials. I should always choose the way of suffering. When we come to interior sufferings, if these could be described, they would make all physical suffering seem very slight. The only repose that these ones enjoy is of an interior kind. Of outward repose they get less and less. What a blessed madness! How thou dost afflict thy lovers! What if I just want to be normal like everyone else? 
then this is probably not a path you should explore. But if you do choose to move further beneath the surface, Teresa describes the deeper states of being as one moves toward the center of consciousness. Into these mansions, poisonous creatures seldom enter. A few little lizards, they do no harm, especially if we take no notice of them. How different thought is from understanding. We now begin to touch the essence beyond the five senses. Treasures in the fifth mansions, no one can describe them. As these states of being are now getting near to the consciousness where being itself dwells, they are of great beauty, and there are such exquisite things to be seen and appreciated in them that the understanding is incapable of describing them in any way accurately without being completely obscure to those devoid of experience. In the deeper mansions, one's essential being has all that it desires because it desires only what is the will of God. The safest thing is to will only what God wills. The important thing is not to think much, but to love much. For love consists not in the extent of our happiness, but in the firmness of our determination to try to please God in everything. The better one gets to know the center of being, the better one comes to realize the misery of one's own condition. Having now tasted the consolations of the sinner, one sees that earthly things are mere refuse. So little by little, one withdraws from them and in this way becomes more and more one's own master. It is a state. The essential being seems to be drowsy so that it neither seems asleep nor feels awake. Here we are all asleep and fast asleep to the things of the world, and to ourselves. In fact, for the short time that the condition lasts, the essential being is without consciousness and has no power to think, even though it may desire to do so. It has completely died to the world so that it may live more fully in God. Suspension of the Faculties When the center of being unites one's essential reality with itself, one understands nothing. The faculties are all lost. Although the light which accompanies it may not be so clear, one's essential being is always aware that it is experiencing this companionship. The essential reality is a different thing from the faculties, and they are not all one and the same. This all sounds like what Joe Slicker was describing that put us in this encounter in the first place. You'll have to decide about that. But let's allow Teresa of Avila to guide us into this final center of being. You must not doubt the possibility of this true union with the will of God. We cannot enter by any efforts of our own. The essential being is led into a state of absorption. When God suspends the essential being in prayer by means of rapture or ecstasy or trance, for I think these are all the same, and how great courage is necessary if we are to receive favors from the one we encounter at the center. I must warn you that there is more need of courage than you imagine. Unless God granted us strength, it would be impossible. When this one bestows rapture, which carry the essential being out of its senses, complete ecstasy does not last long. This secret union takes place in the deepest center of one's being. All that has so far been described seems to have come through the medium of the sense and faculties. But what passes in the union of the depth marriage is very different. This center of our being is something so difficult to describe it is difficult to understand how this essential center can have trials and afflictions and yet be in peace. A king is living in his palace. Many wars are waged in his kingdom, and many other distressing things happen there. But he remains where he is, despite them all. 
These comparisons make me smile, and I do not like them at all, but I know no others. Now, do I just hang out here in this special place and enjoy my oneness with the center of being? Not quite. Let us renounce our self-love and self-will and our attachment to earthly things. Let us practice penance, prayer, mortification, obedience, and all the other good works that you know of. True perfection consists in the love of God and of our neighbor. We should really be loving our neighbor, for we cannot be sure if we are loving God, but we can know quite well if we are loving our neighbor. We should desire and engage in prayer, not for our enjoyment, but for the sake of acquiring the strength which fits us for service. Fix your attention on the center. Now, if you ask me what sort of moderation you should observe in the contemplative work, I will tell you, none at all. In everything else, such as eating, drinking, and sleeping, moderation is the rule. Avoid extremes of heat and cold, guard against too much and too little in reading, prayer, or social involvement. In all these things, I say again, keep to the middle path, but in love take no measure. By having no moderation in contemplation, one will arrive at perfect moderation in everything else. That in everything except contemplation, a person ought to be moderate. How can you get deeper than that?